Keep people coming. So. Okay, all right, we're going to start. Welcome to uh, San Francisco Beacon Analytics. Uh, my name is uh, Chester. Uh, I'm the organizer for the meetups. Uh, I work for GoPro, not for Yelp. Yelp. <laughs> uh, before we start, I would like to thank uh, Yelp, uh, you know, hosting the, our meetups, and thanks for the security people who has been, you know, working late uh, to set this up. And uh, also for the food, I'm, I apologize. Uh, I, it's very hard to anticipate how many pizza to order, so I, I think they run out this time. They usually they had uh, plenty left. Uh, so we also like to help the volunteers, uh, other organizers as well as the people, just uh, Ming Chen, he's uh, from GoPro, and uh, also Ashley, uh, to just you know, set up up to help. Uh, before, before we start to introduce, uh, introduce the, the speakers, uh, you know, on behalf of Yelp, and because they don't have anybody here, so just, uh, just saying they're hiring. So if you're looking for working for Yelp, so you're talking to Rebecca, she's sitting right all the way back under Yelp sign. You can talk to her there. Um, Netflix okay, is hiring so. as well. <laughs> uh, so uh, today we have a, a special announcement before we introduce uh, Ashley from the Open Data Science uh, Conferences. I'd uh, like to say a few words about the conferences. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Ashley on behalf of Open Data Science Conference, uh, ODSC for short. We are a conference that's focused on building the community of data scientists globally, um, and we really promote the growth of using open source tools. So we're starting our community here in Silicon Valley and San Francisco, and I just wanted to introduce myself. Um, we would really encourage you guys to come over and join our community. We have a conference on November 3rd to 4th called ODSC. It's going to be in Santa Clara. If you're interested, it's, there's a discount code for 10% off. Um, it's ODSC-WestSC. Um, people from Kaggle have come to talk, and some data scientists in industry who are really well known have come to talk. It's something cool if, if you guys are interested to check out. And if you have any questions, you can email me at ashley at odsc.com. We do have a meetup coming up on July 13th, if you're interested, at Silicon Valley Data Science. Thanks so much, Chester, for letting me grab a couple seconds with you guys, and I'll pass the uh, mic on to the speaker. Thank you, Ashley. So, um, so nowadays, the uh, business is making decisions based on data. So everybody, you know, pretty much everybody in the Silicon Valley, every company in the Silicon Valley start building their data pipelines. So, you know, because of this, we plan a lot of uh, Data pipeline type of a talks, and uh, today's uh, from Netflix. Um, but uh, on the in the pipelines, we're in also uh, talking with other companies like uh, Yelp and Autodesk and all the other companies who has shared their experience. Uh, you know, we haven't really announced many of those uh, because we are still coordinating the schedules. Um, but uh, they are coming, so there are going to be a lot of talks. Uh, um, you know, their pip uh, data pipeline, their data warehouse, how they do their things, and uh, also we're also talking to. Uh, Walmart talk about uh, how to do their uh, their data pipelines, especially from the data you know, DevOps top, uh, DevOps perspective. So uh, today we talk about the one of data <laughs> one of the data pipelines from Netflix. So uh, Jonathan Barn is uh, from Netflix. They see their engi uh, software engineers building uh, building part of the data pipelines. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, my name. Thank you. Um, my name is Jonathan Bond. Um, I've worked at Netflix for uh, just over a year now. Uh, I arrived in the USA two years ago yesterday, so glad to be here. <laughs> um, so I'm here today to talk about how we run the data pipeline uh, with inside Netflix and what we use it for. Um, I'm from the Apache Kafka side of the data pipeline. I work primarily on the clients and the producers and the brokers, but I've tried to tailor this presentation into a mo more overall end-to-end -end view of how we use the pipeline, how we monitor the pipeline, how our users interact with the pipeline, um, because I think that's of more interest to this, this group. So, agenda, gonna just 
go through. Uh, there'll be a Q&A session at the end, but if you want clarification of anything during the talk, feel free to ask questions as we go through. Um, we will be uploading a video of the presentation for the people putting tripods up to video it. <laughs> yeah, we are videoing it. <laughs> so no need to video, we, we got that covered. Um, uh, so we'll go into the implementation, we'll go how our actual users both configure and set up their own data streams within the pipeline and how uh, we interact with it from an application point of view. And then we'll have some time for Q&As beyond anything which needed clarification as we went through. So start off, Netflix, might have heard of us, we're an internet television network. Uh, we have uh, over 81 million subscribers currently, we're in 190 countries and we stream 125 million hours of TV shows and movies each day. And we have a data pipeline. Um, the data pipeline is the plumbing that connects all our data producers and consumers together in a way that we can centralize the collection of the data um, and support it in a way that our customers can get the, 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 the SLAs and the SLOs that they're looking for. We use our data pipeline for a variety of things. We use it for business data, so viewing information, AB test data as it comes up, all that information through the pipeline. But in the same pipeline, we also put system data through. So logging data, all our logging metrics, and all that information goes into the pipeline as well because it's all actually just data going through the system. So this is a, a very high level view of our data pipeline. We have event producers there on the right hand side, which are uh, responsible for producing the events they decide what needs to be uh, emitted to the data pipeline. We have then the red box in the middle, which I should be spending the next sort of 45 to 50 minutes talking about. But I wanted to just show that on the uh, right hand side, the sort of consumers that we have for the data in the data pipeline. In the top, and the one we're gonna spend most talking about today, um, and the one I know least about, is where we take the data out of the data pipeline, push it into S3, and then allow Hive queries to be run on it. We also take that same data, and if our users want it, we can fire it into an Elasticsearch cluster so that it can be searched in real time using um, Elasticsearch. And finally, we can make it available for other Kafka consumers to consume the data. So all the data always goes through the data pipeline before it ends up at somewhere where it can be consumed by a user. So what are the SLAs for this? So, we came in and we've had data tech pipeline technologies in Netflix for a while. So we had some historical things that we had to work with. Um, the first one was the, av the availability of a client application is the most important thing. Nobody wants the movies to stop streaming, the websites to stop because it couldn't talk to the data pipeline. It's more important to us that customers, our end users, have a good user experience on the website. So we will drop an event rather than cause an error will drop an event rather than blocking a process to get the event out because it's about that user experience on the website and how it reacts when people work with it. This leads to us having a somewhat low, people say, SLA for our events that are delivered. Because our events are, um, because we give no feedback to the application firing the events, whether it is successful or not, as soon as they say emit the event, we take total responsibility for it. There's no way we can go back to the application and say, you know what, that event didn't work properly, can you please go back and try a cane? Which makes it harder for us to maintain the SLAs. So we've, we've deliberately got a, um, a lowish SLA of 99.5%, but in reality, we do actually run with five nines worth of messages. Once it's said, emit an event, there is a very, very high chance that it's gonna get to where it needs to go. Um, we are mandated bits um, are that 1% of event drop will affect data quality, so will affect the, the quality of the recommendations on the website, say, and that sort of thing. And if we ever get to 5% of event drop in an hour, that data becomes totally unusable because it's not statistically sound. And finally, we have a 15-minute end-to-end latency between um, end-to-end latency guarantee from the point that the data is ingested to the data pipeline to when it becomes available for a consumer to use it. Either with inside Hive or Kafka, we guarantee that there will be 15 minutes and it will be available for use from that point. That seems like a reasonably long period of time. 
and it is a long period of time, but that allows us to handle, the, the data scientists were happy with that, and it allows us to handle um, drop messages and those sorts of things by increasing the latency rather than dropping them. And finally, most importantly, we wanted to handle a trillion events a day, which is a big number. <laughs> So what were the challenges? Um, Netflix is a very much a Amazon EC2 shop. And yeah, running a stateful service in a microservices infrastructure where if it fails, the server is a, a cattle, kill it, move on. Much harder to do that when you've got data actually being persistent to the disk. We have unpredictable uh, instance lifecycle because they can be just be terminated. Plus, we are always fighting with little funny network outages which we can't pin down. We'll find that a consumer, uh, a, a, an event producer, can't talk to one of our 3,000 odd brokers. Can talk to the others, but not that one. So how, we need to work on how do we isolate ourselves from those sorts of problems. So this is what our Keystone pipeline looks like. So Keystone is our internal co-name for it. Um, because it's a big pipeline and it moves a lot of data and stuff around. So we've got our Kafka producers on the left-hand side, and these are the actual Kafka producers that we have embedded into our uh, Java applications that allow um, events to be sent. We also have a HTTP endpoint, which allows non-Java applications to be able to just send a HTTP post of a message, and it ends up in the fronting tier. We then, fire, we then have this thing called the internal routing service, routing service, and what that does is that picks up the messages from the fronting tier and make sure they get to where they need to go. Does this, uh, is this event something that needs to go to S3? Is it something that needs to go to Elasticsearch? Is it something that needs to go to Kafka? Is it something that needs to go to all three? So we've built out this, um, this, the, this routing service layer which handles uh, the, the the pushing of the data out to the consumers that need it. We've then got management APIs. Uh, when you're running a trillion messages, we don't want users coming to our team every day saying, we need a new data stream, we need a new routing setup. So we're building out a set of self-management tools that allow them to do that. And then we've got the actual configuration of what's configured, what streams are where, and how it all hangs together. So that at a, a very high level is the Keystone Pipeline. Uh, this Keystone Pipeline has been in existence since uh, basically November last year. Before then, we had our own uh, built solution on top of uh, Chukwa and Suru. Um, but we were finding that wasn't being able to keep up with the availability and the scaling that we wanted. So we've moved to a Kafka-based solution. So I'm going to cover the actual contents of the pipeline first, and then we'll go through how the producers and the consumers actually work with the data. So we have our fronting tier. This tier receives all the events that have been emitted into the uh, pipeline. We decided that it was, um, it was necessary to have multiple clusters um, because it gives us independent failure domains. If one of those Kafka clusters fails, we've got another seven which can carry on working, which we can work with, so that we don't end up with a, a total outage of the entire system. So we run our fronting tier. At the moment, it's just over 3,000 servers. Uh, we have D2 XLs in the Amazon EC2 system, and we have a replication factor of two enabled and a retention cycle will be between eight and 24 hours. The reason why, so we found that the replication factor actually works for us because we've got a 15 minute SLA. So the chances are when a data arrives, we, we're gonna get it out of the system into the back end very, very quickly. So having a, um, a relatively small replication factor was something that we had to balance with. If we have more replication factors, the amount of data that's going between the brokers just to replicate it became all consuming. We're running 3,000 servers, we've only got two replications, and pretty much all our 
brokers are running at full network utilization all the time. So increasing the replication factor was going to lead to an unnecessary expense for, repli uh, for replication, which we didn't actually need because we were getting the data out of the front in Kafka to where the consumers needed it quick enough. Um, yes, we have independent failure designs. And then the other thing we've done, and the other nice thing about having a fronting tier for us is we separate the producers from the consumers. We are in totally in control of the consumers with our internal routing service. We don't trust our consumers to go off and do a denial of service attack and keep on pummeling the Kafka client. By separating off the producers and the consumers, we can do the most important thing, which is to ingest the message from the producer that's producing it. Consumers then connect to a different Kafka cluster, and they can do whatever they want to process the message without impacting our ability to receive any message coming in from the uh, producers of events. So by separating the producers from the consumers, we've given ourselves a, a bit of a buffer so that we're only dealing with one problem at a time. And it also means that we can scale the producers and the consumers totally separately. We don't have to have the same number of um, shards within a part, same number of partitions within a stream for the producer and the consumer. If we know that we need this number of um, partitions to handle the inbound workload, but we know that the consumers are actually slow in uh, processing the requests, we can give them more partitions specifically for consuming. It's the ability for us to be able to control and separate our producer and consumer workloads. So we stand this up in three AWS regions. Uh, our general shape of a Kafka cluster is we have a, uh, a dedicated zookeeper ensemble for each Kafka cluster, which has five servers within it. We wanted to make sure that there was no failure domain between the Kafka clusters. So we manage them each separately from each other. They each have their own configuration. They each have their own zookeeper. They each have their own auto-scaling groups. They are totally separate from each other. And then we introduced this uh, new piece of functionality into Kafka called the Rackware rep Replica Assignment. And what this does is when partitions within Kafka need to be distributed across the different servers within the cluster, it makes sure that we never have the primary and the secondary partition in the same availability zone. So we can't suffer from a failure of an availability zone or a, um, uh, an instance causing us to have a message drop. We need to lose two. And this is now included with the Kafka 0 0.10 release. So I know what you're thinking. Jonathan, what do you call these clusters? Well, we named them after mountains. <laughs> so yeah, that's what they're called. So we have Blanc, Denali, Elbert, Everest, Himalayas, Robson, Rocky, Whitney, and Ural. Ural is the test one. So this is what we. These are how we categorize and uh, distribute our streams. Um, finally, we needed something else. We've got Death Valley. <laughs> so Death Valley is where we've got some workload and we don't really want it. So we'll just route it to Death Valley. There's a cluster there. There's nothing much going on there, but the messages just go there to die. <laughs> because we just, sometimes it's just, right, we're going to route stuff to there and let it wither. So. That's our naming system. It's amazing how Kafka clusters get a personality. I keep saying we want to treat them like cattle, but no, they're becoming pets. So how do we decide how to deploy our Kafka clusters? As I said, we prefer multiple small clusters. Um, we found that we don't want more than 200 brokers within a cluster, and that each cluster shouldn't have more than 10,000 partitions. What that means is some of our uh, streams are entirely on one cluster because that's the size it needs to be. We're looking at the future into seeing if there's a way we can distribute that workload across multiple clusters because that would be a nice thing to be able to do, but we're not there yet. We try and have a, uh, an even distribution of partitions and their replicas because we need to uh, balance out the workloads. As I said, we, we, do, we drive the network very hard to these instances, and without making sure that the uh, distribution of the uh, uh, partitions and their replicas across all the server means we lead to hotspots 
which introduce latency into the system, and later you'll see that latency is one of my worst enemies at the moment. We found that um, clusters are easier to manage when they have the streams with the same quality of service. Um, if we have a stream which doesn't need to have the high replication factor, keeping those all together in one cluster means that it's very easy for us to organize ourselves. So we know that, for example, Himalayas, just an example, is the one which has got the low priority topics. We know that Everest is the one where we are going to have extra retention periods in the future. So we're setting ourselves up to organize our uh, workloads around their retention and um, uh, replication policies based on the individual clusters. And we've also found that uh, it's more efficient. It's more efficient to have uh, related streams together in the same cluster. What that means is we've got some applications that send to six or seven streams. If they're all in the same cluster together, they have many, many less connections to the brokers open because all the work they're going to do is focused on one cluster, which means the Kafka uh, producers and the brokers become a lot more efficient in the connections they're using. They can batch the sending of the messages to the broker, reuse the connections, and we don't end up wasting resources in spreading our workload across every broker whenever an event is shaved, so saved. So we try really hard to keep them related together, um, but it's not always possible because sometimes you need to balance out workloads in front of the uh, things for the better of the system. And as I said, absolutely have a dedicated zoo keeper ensemble for each Kafka cluster. Um, we've learned that one the hard way. <laughs> so that covers our very high level view of uh, the Kafka piece and how messages arrive. So the next piece is the internal routing service. Um, this runs, uh, so the internal routing service is actually implemented as a set of SAMHSA jobs, and we run them with inside Docker containers, which then run inside of instances. So we have, uh, basically we set it up so that each SAMHSA instance is responsible for a stream sending it to a destination, so maybe S3, maybe Kafka, maybe, maybe uh, 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 Kafka, whatever the third one, Elasticsearch, and then a set of partitions. And that becomes its sole responsibility. If that container dies, our infrastructure will start up that container someone else and carry on processing it. So we break up all our routing rules into individual Docker containers which do that job. And then we manage that across our fleet of ASGs and instances which actually handle it. So what happens is um, you come in in the management and uh, a user will come along and say, I want to filter all messages that have been sent to the AB test stream and I want them all to go to Elasticsearch. Or they can go in and say, I want to fill all the AB test, of all the messages going to the AB test stream, which has got some XPath query that evaluates the true. Or they can say, I want to forward all the A-B test messages, but don't worry about forwarding these sets of data fields because they aren't relevant in this place or it's not secure for us to put them there. So we've, we've, we've built this system on top of SAMSA, which allows us to not only select which messages get sent to a given place, but also uh, be able to transform and project the data on the way through in a very simple way. I mean, there's nothing clever in there but it's, it's something that we're looking at building out in the future. So this is the chart I know least about in the deck because it's not the bit I deal with daily. So I apologize for anything I get wrong in the next bit. So we have the uh, internal router service and this is where we're getting the data to come in from. So it's the thing we've just spoken about. Now, when we want to get to the data to Hive, which is where our big data processing actually happens, this is what we do. So the internal routing service writes the data to an S3 intermediary place. Now, the data with inside the uh, pipeline is always JSON. So we take the JSON and then we transform it into key value serialized format with inside the S3 intermediary. And basically each job is writing, each router service job is writing to its own S3 file the contents of everything that's coming in. And then what happens is, Every, um, as we come across and we find data, every 15 minutes, we'll take that data, 
We'll cleanse it again, so if we need to remove any personal identification, IP addresses, anything like that, we'll cleanse the data, and then we'll push it into the S3 system. So at this point now, we've got an S3 file which has got the data which is going to be able to be searched using Hive in the future. We've got it organized by stream, we've got it organized by partition, we've got it organized by time and date of that file. That data is now actually searchable at that point. And our first goal is we have to get it there within 15 minutes to that point so that someone can write a Hive query and within 15 minutes, it's available in that point. At the moment, our average is just under a minute to get it in there and I can't remember unless there was a proper outage when it last got up to 15 minutes, touch wood. Um, so the data ends up in the S3 system. So that, that DMUX process is just going through, processing the JSON data, converting it into key value serialized pairs, and then cleansing it. And then what happens is we then have a merge job. And the merge job is watching the S3 files. And when we start to see a propensity of messages which are for the next hour, it starts collecting the messages up for the last hour, bundling them up into a separate file, and then storing that. So we have a, a continuously growing hour by hour by hour summary of the data that's come before, whilst we've still got the, the data which has happened in the current app hour available for processing. So you can run jobs either on the historical data, which is over an hour old, or you can run data on the jobs of the data that's actually happening right this very second. Um, we store the data in KVS format on the, uh, the middle S3, and in the S3 ver the version uh, merged, it's in Parquet format, and we use GSIP compression in both places. Um, we run jobs using uh, the Netflix Genie scheduling engine, um, and data can be searched on both, as I said, the unmerged and the merged um, data sets. But as I said, we got 15 minutes to get it to that first one, and we have to have the data summarized within two hours for the next piece to happen. Funny thing happened on the way to Quorum. We started off by having a small number of Kafka clusters, and as I said, we learned by this mistake. Rather than having eight, we had three or four, which meant they were all huge. And we just did it purely on the volume of data and the classified by the importance of the data. And we, we didn't do anything else. And then we were in production for two whole days before it failed and refused to restart. Not just restart, it was we restart, it started to recover, and then it collapsed again. <laughs> and then relapsed, and then collapsed again. And we got the problem down to it was the Zookeeper server caused an original outage, and then it was taking hours for the Zookeeper server to re-coordinate itself to be able to allocate leaders and primary partitions of everything it was coming back up. So this wasn't good, because we've just brought out our shiny new toy, and it didn't work quite as we'd hoped. Um, we had 80% message drop for hours, and here we were looking for no more than 0.5 positions. But in good news, I was on a plane, so I missed it all. Um, <laughs> so other people got to deal with that mess, and I, I just looked at it the next morning and said, well, guys, what did you do? Um, so, unleash the monkeys. We couldn't let this happen again, because it's totally unacceptable. So, first goal, when the failure happens, make sure we can receive data. As long as we can receive data, we can always get it to the consumers at some point. We need to keep the fronting tier up under any circumstance. The data might arrive 15 minutes late, it might arrive two hours late, it might arrive four hours late, but at least it becomes an option then to process it. So we quickly realize that the most important thing that we need to do as a pipeline is make sure that we're resilient for anything that happens to our cluster. So what we do is we stand up for each of our main clusters, we stand up a little teeny weeny three server cluster. Doesn't do any work. Just got three servers in there to make sure the DNS, DNS names are registered. But it's ready to scale up at any moment to be able to handle the workload for any one of our RAIN clusters. Now, it's not a, um, it's not a copy of our real cluster. 
it has smaller machines, it has a retention period of uh, four hours, um, it doesn't have replicas, but it's there purely to get us out of a hole when we need something running with that cluster location so we can carry on receiving data. And every week, we practice failing over. Monday morning, first person on call goes in, picks one, says, that's it, EU West 1, Himalayas, it's coming down. And we make sure we can do it every week without anybody noticing. It, 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 it's brave without automation. So how do we actually do it? So failover, abandon the Kafka cluster. So here we have our event producers. And what's happening is um, this cluster on the uh, right-hand side has gone bad. We know it's gone bad. We're dropping messages. Um, but we need to recover. So what we've done is we've, we've automated a set of scripts. So on the right-hand side, you see we've got our failover clusters. So the other thing about the failover clusters is they share the one zookeeper cluster. Because it's only there for temporary use, and we're not expecting to run many of them at any one time in one um, AWS region, we just have one there thing. So we go off. We ask it to scale up. We ask it to scale up as a percentage of the main traffic for that one. And off it goes, it scales up. Once it's scaled up, we copy across the topic definitions. So all the streams and topics that were defined in this one get moved across with the current state from the original one that failed to the, uh, the new replacement one, the temporary one. At that point, we then start up a new set of routing jobs. So our routing jobs are actually consuming from both the new and the old Kafka cluster at this point, because it means that we can process the messages the ones that are still available, if we can get to them, they'll still make it to the destination. And anything new that arrives on the new one will get to where they need to go as well. And then we take the big switch and we flip over all the data from the event producers um, to the new replacement cluster. And at that point, we're good. We can take our time. We can work out what went wrong with the first one. All our messages are being safely received, safely delivered to where they need to go. And we can go from the state of, you know what, this isn't going right, to fully swapped over in just under five minutes. So when we've said that we can lose up to five minutes worth of data within the hour, this means that as long as we're quick enough and confident enough that, you know what, this isn't going to be a, uh, a failure situation that we're going to be able to recover and work around, we just need to fail over now. We just fail over. So what do we do next? Well, we fix it, we go rebuild it, we do whatever we need to do to the old Kafka cluster to make it good. Once, once the routing jobs are finished consuming what they were going to consume, we can go away and rebuild it the next day. Um, we also find this very useful because if we want to apply maintenance to a system, we just do this failover thing. We then apply maintenance to this thing and then we fail over back again because it means that we've always got the ability to fail back to the uh, failover one if the maintenance didn't go as appropriate. And it means we can take our time and get the uh, testing around the actual upgrade of the broker so that it's right for us. And it's complicated. So we have three buttons. <laughs> Prepare the failover, failover, go back to normal. And it just works, <laughs> which is why we can do it on a weekly basis, because we've automated it. It's so important to our failure situation that we need to be able to confidently <coughs> take the traffic and move it to another um, cluster whenever we need to. So uh, scaling up strategy. We over-provision for our daily and failover traffic. Uh, how many people here have heard of Chaos Kong? So in Netflix, we have uh, Chaos Kong exercises. And what that does is every couple of weeks, month or so, we will fail over from an entire AWS region just to prove that we can. That moves traffic around from the, the, the region that's failed over to the different regions in quite a large way, because we're now handling probably twice the amount of traffic that we normally expect in the other regions at that point. Kafka isn't great at scaling up, so we, we provision our consumption at that point 
to make sure that we can handle that data when it needs to happen. So that at any point, if we're practicing a failover or if we're doing the failover for real, we can handle the pipeline data at that point. Um, we do scale up when we find that the traffic's going. So we have two main ways, well, the two main ways of scaling a, uh, a Kafka cluster, but of course the, the, the preferred way is to add a new Kafka cluster. But if we need to scale up an existing Kafka cluster, we can add partitions to it, and then we can move partitions around to make sure it's balanced. So adding partitions is the easiest way. Um, you could do it if you're using keyed messages in Kafka, which is the ability to del um, deliver messages in a spe specified order for a key. Uh, but it does allow us to quickly just add some partition data for brokers. But it has a trade-off because we have to work out where to provision those uh, partitions by hand. We have to then um, balance out the workload in that way. So of course the other way is we need to sometimes move partitions around. Uh, generally works in all situations, but it's time consuming and the, re the replication of traffic when we move a primary partition from one server to another server means all that eight hours worth of data that we had now needs to be replicated from one AWS cluster to an, and one AWS instance to another AWS instance. And as I've said, we spend a lot of our time network bound anyway. So starting to copy data around unnecessarily doesn't make that situation any better. Um, so what we've do, done is we've created a tool which allows us to divide that reassignment of partitions over time so that uh, the data can move out and we're not copying every partition around at every point so we can span it out over two, three days to make sure that we, we balance the workload across. Getting back onto more exciting things, data pipeline user experience. So, given you the, the, the high level view of how the data pipeline works, how our routing jobs work, so how do our users actually work with our data pipeline? As I said, we don't want to be able to um, manually go and have to do this every time. So we started off with a spreadsheet and we now have a web UI um, to manage it. And then we've also taken the time to integrate all the Kafka producers and consumers and brokers and SAMSA jobs into the existing Netflix monitoring infrastructure. So this is what our users work with when they want to create a topic. Uh, we can't quite read that. So that's currently processing uh, about 256 meg worth of data. And you can, can't really see, but um, in here we've got at the top the data that's going through the system now, the, the amount that it was provisioned for, the quality of service preference, do they prefer it high or low, which is just for us to get an idea of what people expect for the data. We've then got whether there's a filter, an XPath filter, whether they're going to do some projection on the data as it goes through. And then down here, we've got the routing rules saying that some of the data is going to Hive, some of it's going to Elasticsearch, and some of it's going to Kafka. So customer comes in, fills in this data. Today, sends on call an email who goes away and creates it. But we're working on automating that piece as well because we don't want to have to be able to manually to do it. But it was more important to get away from the spreadsheet to be able to collect the data um, and then go and create it manually rather than wait until we got the, the back end done. So you can see we've got the edit. We can edit streams. We can edit where, where the routes are going to go. It's, a, it's our, a UI for doing it. So they've gone off and they've defined how they actually, what they actually want to do with the data, what stream they want to send it to and where they want that stream routing to. So I'm just gonna walk through now what a Keystone client actually looks like with inside a Java client. So we've got a Java client and that depends on basically uh, four services. Our KS service, which is Netflix configuration uh, source, which is open sourced the Eureka service, 
which is uh, Netflix's discovery service to be able to find servers uh, without using DNS. Atlas service, which is the uh, graphing monitoring of infrastructures. And then finally, the data pipeline on the, the right hand side. So Java, the Java client decides that it's going to send a message to somewhere. So it just says, I'm going to send a message to a topic. That's all it's done. We then go to our KS and say, right, given this topic, AB stream, who's going to get it? And it will say, you know what, that's a Himalayas one. So we go along and we then load the configuration for Himalayas. Um, we find where the bootstrap servers are. So we have a list of them. We take that to the Eureka service and say, give me the IP address for those. We then use those IP addresses to bootstrap against the Kafka brokers. And at that point, we've now got established data between the Java client and the data pipeline. We can now send messages from the Java client to the data pipeline and on their way. So we can start logging metrics data, uh, which we push out to Atlas every minute on how many connections we've had, how many messages we've sent, how many errors we've gotten, all that sort of good information. Of course, if, the connection, if we come in and we look up a, a, another topic, um, uh, for example, NF errors log, which is another one of our topics, and that's also on Himalayas, well, we can skip all those steps. We've already got the connection, we can use it. If it's on a different one, well, we'll go open and we'll open up an entirely new instance of a Kafka producer to handle that data because we want to be able to isolate inside the client as well as in the broker servers pieces, each of them together. So they each have their own buffer, they each have their own configuration, they're each totally independent as, as they can be, showing the same JVM, so that if one has a problem, we can still use the different Kafka clients to talk to the pipeline in each place. So how does the user actually create and send an event? Um, we have two main ways, as I said on the overview chart. The first is they can use a Java API. So today, we just extend the log logging infrastructure. So we extend log4j. We have a non-blocking system. It's serialized into JSON and sends it on the way. And if people care about whether the message is sent or not, they have to go to our metric system to look at the data. It's not about uh, being able to get an re error response, an exception, or a, a future back. They have to do it through the metrics. And then we've also got the HTTP endpoint for non-Java applications. Hopefully this is readable. So this is how we structure data with inside Netflix. Um, so this is an example validation alerts. And what it is, is we have a interface annotatable, which is a marker interface, which says this is one of our data objects. And it's saying that the name is example validation alerts, which means by default, that's the stream we want to send the message to. We've then got an annotation here saying the columns. And what these do are these map to the, the, the data that we actually want to put into Hive. So the customer ID will go into a column called customer ID. The reason will go into a, a, a column called reason. And the uh, uh, days behind will go into the, the days behind column. So we're actually encapsulating the data, what the data is, its types, and also where it's going. And then that means that when they come along, they can just create an instance of that message. So create a new validation alert. Uh, 131275 was the customer number, some reason what was wrong, and 80 was the, the value. They can just go off and call the log manager dot log event alert, and that's it. We've taken responsibility of it at that point. We've said that there is a 99.5% uh, uh, chance of that message getting there, but we're actually at 99.9999% chance of doing that line of code, it ending up in Elasticsearch, Kafka, or S3 for processing with Hive. Uh, some people didn't want to be able to define the message as an annotatable. They just wanted to find the data to be sent on the fly. So what they do is they actually just say, use the um, Chukwa key value, ser the Hadoop key value serialization method. Say, I want to send it to example validate event. 
add key value, add key value, add key value. And here it is actually just a straight log.info. And what we do is we allow the, the, the logger infrastructure to be configured saying, if I'm sending it for this uh, um, logger, just to put it into the data stream and not output it to the console. So when we very first came up with this in Netflix, we decided that the logger was the way of doing it. But now we're running into problems around how do we serialize the data. Some people want to serialize the data in different formats. We're running into people who are now saying, I want to know whether it works or no, didn't work with inside my code, so I can take corrective action. So we're looking at how we're going to replace this API with something new and a bit more multi-threaded and uh, a modern way of dealing with these sorts of problems. So talking with uh, oldie worldy stuff. Uh, Backend data at the moment doesn't support hierarchical data, so we have to flatten all the data as it's going out. Uh, so we take an adjacent object. So if we've, got, if we've got an object here, for example, which has got field one and a val one, field two and a val two, what we do is we actually expand that before we send it across the network into object.field one is val one, object.field two is val two. We only do it one level deep because that seems to be the sweet spot at the moment for getting the data into Hive in a way that's efficiently processed and handling most of the use cases. But of course now, in, historically, the Hive was the only consumer of data. And we've now got people who only want the data to go to Elasticsearch, only want the data to go to the Kafka clusters, and they're saying, what do you mean it's going to be flattened out data and losing all the fidelity of what was inside the message? I can't use arrays, I can't use nested structures. Give it to me in a way that can be processed. So as part of the new API, we're looking at how do we marry these two worlds together in a way that we can send messages, um, <coughs> have them delivered to Hive in this format, but also have them delivered to Elasticsearch and Kafka clusters in a way that means that they can be processed to their full capability. So as I said, the data pipe uses, the pipeline uses the standard Netflix monitoring infrastructure. So we've written statistic reporters for collecting metrics from the clients and the brokers that send the data to Netflix Atlas. Um, previously, Netflix released an open source project called Netflix Exhibitor, which uh, will monitor the Zookeeper cluster for us and generate trace and alert information. And we make all, uh, by default, we make all warning and error messages available to be searched through Elasticsearch. So on slide three or four at the beginning, I said, one of the data streams is messages that are logged using an error or a warning are collected. So every message that comes out with an error or a warning flag through the logger infrastructure will end up in Elasticsearch and in Hive so that it can be searched. So uh, this is the Kafka monitoring service, and this is um, part of us building out what it means to be able to get beyond just the basic metrics of this number of records was sent, this number of records was dropped. So we've, we've written an application which actually goes and probes and sends messages and understands what's going on. So it looks holistically at the end-to-end -end flow of the data rather than looking at just the producer, just the broker or the consumer. So it will inject messages into the system. It will time how long it takes. It will see what goes missing. It will see that sort of information. But it will also detect if a broker disappears, which is a hard thing to, for a metrics to do because you don't know if the metrics has just stopped or whether that is actually disappeared. So we actively will go and find brokers of the metric. We will send heartbeat messages and we will continually measure the latency of how long it took a message to put a message in for it to appear at the other end. Um, we find that we need to be able to have that happening from the same instance so that we get an accurate clock measurement of what's going on. And it also handles the fact that we have many, many partitions and many, many streams. And we, we need to be able to monitor how they're progressing all at the same time. We can't just give all that to the Atlas metrics uh, system. It's just too much. So we've actually have code which will check to make sure that every partition is being consumed, every uh, offset is progressing, to make sure that we're actually keeping up with data that's going through.
So this is a Kafka chart for those people who want Kafka. These are the metrics that we look at every day. So the uh, dropped and su successful message counts, that's really important. <laughs> the buffer available bytes is a track of how far behind uh, a message, is, uh, how far behind sending the message from the client to the broker is, how quickly the broker is responding, TCP timeouts, errors, and retransmissions. Um, until I'd seen how the effects of timeouts and errors, I wouldn't have believed how badly they can affect message drop. If you have uh, a broker or a producer which is having high counts of TC, um, errors and retransmissions, that can really cause problems for the entire cluster. For a start, your, your uh, producers can't send stuff to the quick enough to the broker because they're all being rejected as packets and it's having to resend everything, which just slows it down, which means that we start backing up messages and eventually drop when we run out of buffer space. If you've got your broker has got TCP errors, it's got the same problem, but it's also receiving from the clients and doing the replica. So we, we work really, really hard to be able to spot those sorts of things from the metrics. Free disk space, yeah. Run out of disk space, that's not good for Kafka. Uh, how close we are to the network utilization at any point. The rates of Kafka API messages. So this one bit us one day. Um, we had uh, about 9,000 uh, Docker containers all start up at the same time. And they weren't actually asking for any data. They weren't going to send anything, but they all started up the connections. So they started up wasn't sending any data. And we found that Kafka has, client has this thing that says, five minutes after starting up, if nothing's gone on, go and get a configuration of the cluster. So it would load every broker and every partition, find out where everything was. So at exactly five minutes after the, um, zoo, uh, after the uh, Docker cluster had started up, all 7,000 servers pinged <laughs> saying, I want my configuration. Kafka builds that configuration on the fly. Doesn't cache it, builds it. Which meant that after a minute, they said, hmm, haven't heard anything, better ask again. Which wasn't good for our cluster. <laughs> our cluster had a bad day, and failing over didn't really help in that situation, because all that workload just moved across. So we uh, reached into the configuration and just said, if it's one of these servers, just don't use Kafka at all because you're not actually doing it. So we, we learned some important lessons that day that some of the Kafka API messages that, um, flows are more expensive than other flows and you need to be able to monitor the rate of those at an individual message level because it's uh, really important to your system as a whole. And then finally, consumer lag metrics, which is how far behind both consumers and SAMSA are from the latest received message to what they're processing at the moment. So some pretty pictures. This is what our um, graphs look like that we get to see for our brokers. So this is the 99% produce response time. Percent of uh, the responses were happening in, in one and a half seconds, which is pretty poor. Um, but we also saw that the fetch response time was up, we saw the request latency was up, and we saw the TCP timeouts, was we were timing out TCP requests eight a second. So this together said, this broker is an outlier, it's got something wrong with the network, what are we going to do about it? But we run 3,000 brokers, it's really hard to go and spot the outliers. So we're currently playing with ways of visualizing our cluster. So this is our this is every Kafka cluster in our fronting tier showing the um, TCP uh, latency happening at that point. And you can see in the middle, we've got one which is in the Blanc cluster in EU West 1, which has got a 29 um, second latency. So it's much higher than everything else. So we know that that's where to go from. But it's, 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 it's really quite hard to be able to visualize when you've got this amount of data and you're looking for subtle differences. So it's actually colored by um, cluster and region so that we can see that actually, you know what? These are around there. 
that's, uh, that whole cluster is under stress as well. So we probably ought to be looking at why that one is behaving differently than saying these around the edge, which are nice and small and friendly. So other ways we have of monitoring is we've got a Kafka dashboard. Uh, so this allows us to go in and look for any broker, how many partitions, what its health is, and that sort of data. Um, we've found that from a producer point of view, it's very important to be able to see what's going inside, inside of a producer. Um, so we've written tools that go in and use reflection to go and peek around inside the producer client itself to find out what the internal state is so that we can connect to any instance and say, what's the problem with this producer client? Because our, our, our users don't care. It's a problem with the producer. They just want to know how to get the messages through. So we have, we've added tools to allow us to see that internal state. So a typical problem, we receive uh, that messages are being dropped, but we notice that, that multiple topics all in the same cluster. We check the buffer available bytes, and we see that it's been steadily decreasing for the last 90 minutes. So we suspect that something's not getting through. It's not a total drop of messages, but some of them aren't getting through. We check the producer internals viewer, um, which finds that on some of the instances, a small number, on one of the instances specifically, a small number of topic and partitions is building up the queue and it's used up the whole buffer. And at that point, we know that, you know what, this, this producer has probably got a communication problem with that broker for this one node. And everybody else in the world sees it fine, but this producer can't. So we go into the, CAF, the dashboard, we uh, check the topic, topic and partitions they can't send to are all located on the same broker, and we find, yes, it is. We go and look at the messages and the metrics for that one, and we find that there was a bad network between those two. And it's one bad network connection between the clients and the system. So our stats as of yesterday. Yesterday, we did 700 billion unique messages a day. We peaked out at over a trillion a day over the holidays. I was trying to work out a way of visualizing what 700 billion events were. If each event was a marble, whilst I've been speaking, we could have built a tower to the moon and back is what 700 million events a day looks like, which is a significant number of events. Um, the reason why we've gone down from a trillion to 700 billion is it was over the holidays. We decided after the holidays that we need to go and talk to some of our users and say, you really want to be sending that number of events? It's costing us this much. So it's not just a drop in uh, viewership or anything like that. It was as much a proactive us going out and finding the larger teams and saying, you need to scale back some of your event producing. So as I said, we're at five nines availability for the last two weeks and trying to think a way of visualizing what five nines worth of messages delivery over the, <coughs> the last messages that happened in the last 50 minutes whilst I've been sport talking. So we have a tower which goes up to the moon and back and we have a tennis court with one layer deep of marbles, is what we've dropped. <laughs> we copy 1.45 petabytes of data a day. Um, we fluctuate between 9 and 24 gigabytes a second between peak and off-peak, which means that we can copy Wikipedia in just under two seconds across the pipeline. Uh, from an end-to-end -end latency point of view, it takes 0.8 seconds to get data to the Kafka consumer. It takes one second to get data to S3, and it takes 13 seconds to get the data indexed into Elasticsearch. We have 4,000 Kafka brokers, which are at Kafka 0.9 uh, in total across Netflix, and we have 3,000 3, in the fronting tier. Our routing tier contains 13,000 containers, of which 7,000 are for S3, 4,500 for Kafka, 1,500 are for Elasticsearch. This one just really upsets me. We have 330,000 instances of the Kafka producer running with inside all our nodes. Some nodes have many um, instances because it's a cluster of um, uh, Docker containers, so they all count as individual instances. Some of them are, we've got an application and it's sending to all eight uh, brokers. So each of those is its own producer instance. So we have 330,000 and we have just started as in the next yesterday or today, 
the upgrade from Kafka 0 0.98 to 0 0.9 across the entire fleet of all our producers of the messages. And we currently do this with 10 engineers. Uh, we are responsible for the development, support, and operations of the pipeline. And um, we're also starting to look, our team is looking at how we will introduce uh, stream processing to this picture. So finally, last stat, every second of content watched on Netflix generates an event. Go on, binge. Makes my day more exciting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to leave that chart up, which is a set of useful websites for some of the technologies I've spoken about. Any questions? I, I'm sure the charts will be made available. <laughs> Any questions? So, uh, Charles Allen, nice to meet you. Thanks for coming and talking. No uh, kind of a question about monitoring your partitions. Mm -hmm. uh, how much utility do you find in kind of viewing the overall consumer lag coming out of like like uh, stuff that's consuming from Kafka uh, versus just looking at individual partition lag? Uh, so the question was, what's the, uh, what's the relative benefit of looking at lags at both a partition and a max lag point of view um, across the whole of the topic? So we find that the max lag is a good indication because when we've got, what was it, however number of thousands, numbers of consumers, we can't look at them at each one at each partition level. So looking at the max lag for the complete JVM is a good starting point to spot problems, but we find we quickly get down to having to look at individual partitions. Um, the max just gives us a nice summary before we have to dive in and look at individual partitions. And we're having to come up with ways of um, visualizing the consumer lag. What we would like to be able to do is say, the consumer lag is currently 10,000 messages, which is the equivalent of 15 minutes worth of data. So we're looking at how can we actually take a consumer lagging count of data and make it a time value, which is what's actually important. Other questions? Hey, um, what, were the, what was the progression of this project? You were building out your data pipeline system. Uh, what were the milestones you hit, and how long did it take? So we started off with the, um, uh, the, the Chukwa original implementation of the pipeline, and we were replacing it with Kafka, and it took us about six months to swap out between the two. Um, from a milestone point of view, it was about working out how we can manage and monitor the Kafka brokers, which took the majority of the time. And then the, the next thing was actually standing up and configuring the server and start pushing out the, the Kafka implementations to everyone because everyone needed the implementations. And then the final thing was the once we made it live, it all failed miserably. So we then had another month and a half to fix that. <laughs> what is acceptance testing strategy for your project? Because it feels like it's quite hard to test what you built. Uh, so the question is, what's the acceptance testing? That's a very good question. Um, so for the Kafka 09 rollout we're currently doing, which is our, by far our biggest single push, what we're doing is we've, uh, we're testing under load ourselves, and we're working with individual teams and saying, can you please pick this up first? Use it as part of your canary testing, use it as part of your um, integration testing, and then when you're happy, we'll go and talk to the next team. So as I've said, we've got 330,000 places we need to do this upgrade. We don't want to go and find there's a problem. So we've done what we can internally, but we can't get to a, a large enough percentage of our workload to traffic. For the brokers, it's slightly easier because we can go and do that trick where we have a failover one, apply maintenance, so we can flip between it as we find problems. But for the, for the actual pushing out of producer and consumer logic, it's much harder. Hi, thanks. Great talk, uh, Dana Powers. Um, so, a couple of questions. One is, I think you said all events are serialized in JSON, mm -hmm. and then so then uh, the question is, how do you manage, or what are your thoughts on maintaining quality and like schema changes, or like is that something you do on the producer side, consumer side? What are your thoughts on that? Um, 
Netflix traditionally has a culture around freedom and responsibility. So we don't have schemas at the moment. We are just starting a push to investigate what it will take to introduce schemas across our producers and consumers because we're finding there are a couple of problems. One is nobody can find data that's interesting anymore. We've got hundreds and thousands of data sources, but nobody can go and find what stream is actually important. So the first is being able to find data. Um, the next problem we've got is people can't change data because they don't know who's consuming a particular data stream and its type. So being able to tie up producers and consumers and say, when I make this change, here's how I need to do it. And then the final one is around governance. Um, as we're getting bigger, we need to make our, our stuff more uh, transparent in how we strip data, which we don't actually care about, but privacy groups do. So that's part of what we're doing with streamers, but that's our next quarter's project. And I'm sure Christmas time I'll be talking about it. <laughs> Other questions? And if there's any Netflix PLMs in here, that wasn't a commitment. <laughs> that was just a guidance. <laughs> More questions? Actually, I, I was uh, trying to follow Dina's question about the schema. We find that uh, in at least uh, in the company I worked for, uh, the schema changes uh, is a big hassle. And of course, uh, I know the, some of the early uh, Netscape uh, Engineers, uh, for example, people from Catastreams using they call the schema list, mm -hmm. essentially key value pairs and dynamically generating the tables. So uh, is that kind of a work still carry on? Um, so uh, the question is uh, how are we adapting any technologies and things? So as I said, Netflix has a freedom responsibility culture. So everyone finds off and does the better the way that works for them we're going to be probably proposing an Avro-based solution for Avro to describe schemas, and we'll probably keep the JSON serialization so that people don't have to use Avro, um, but we want to make it so that people can decide whether or not to adopt schemas themselves. So, uh, I'm gonna ask one more question. So for, I don't know you're uh, familiar with the query, uh, the data format for query. I know you're on, uh, in your talk, you, you mentioned that the most of data format is a, a JSON, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, for the query, so you're, after you're storing the hive, you're essentially using Parquet, is that right? Yeah, so we, we take the uh, JSON data, we flat it to key value pairs, and that's what we actually search on today. I see. So we don't, we don't support JSON searching in our back end. See. So is, uh, how's the query performance uh, in your, once you're landing in your data warehouse? Uh, you need to find a big data person, not a Kafka <laughs> person for that question, sorry. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Hi, so uh, you mentioned that people sometimes come to you and ask you, for example, to, for, you know, to do, to get feedback on the message that they're sending, whether it was, uh, you know, uh, received or, or not. So what are the other common requests that people come with, you know, uh, did, did you see any higher level patterns emerge on top of uh, your Kafka usage, like, you know, things that people do for uh, item potency or, you know, exactly once delivery? So the question is, what are the quality of services that we're finding that people ask for? We haven't had the discussion around exactly once data delivery for the pipeline, because I think people understand the pipeline's job is there to be at least once delivery, and that's what it specializes in. Um, we couldn't do a trillion messages a day if we were looking at doing at exactly once delivery. So from, a, from a, uh, that point of view, I think people look at other solutions other than the data pipeline if they want to solve those jobs. They might still use Kafka, but it's not a data pipeline job. Um, what are the, what is, what's the most common query? So the most common query I can think of is two, which is, why didn't my data get sent? And two, what does my data look like in Hive? <laughs> because at the point where you send it, there's no uh, correlation to how it's gonna end up when it looks like in Hive. There's, there's steps in there which are in multiple to complete end-to-end -end view at the moment. So I think those are the two questions that we field most regularly about what they would like to see improved about the pipeline. Any more? No. Okay. Hi, uh, great talks. Thanks for that. Um, I have a question about. Um, so you mentioned about the eager failover between clusters or like data center regions. 
um, how do you do you have a first of all uh, do you have a SLA on top of that like when the data was copied over, and how do you handle the traffic? How do you just make sure that it doesn't kill um, or like create traffic pick for production? Uh, so are you talking about when we fail over uh, a Kafka cluster or when Netflix fails over the, its entire the, infrastructure? Like you eager eagerly uh, fail over a like, cluster. Um, so. If it's a failover of our cluster, we take responsibility of it. We know the sizing, so we know what's going to happen on the other side. We know what size we need for the given workload when we reduce the replication. For when we do a failover at the, the higher level, which isn't just a pipeline, it's the entire Netflix organization when we fail over, we understand what percentage of the traffic is going to go where, so what percentage is going to go from... Uh, US East to EU and that sort of thing. So we pre-provision the data in there ready for it. We pre-provision the capacity for it because we can't. There's two problems. We can't scale up quickly enough. And the other thing is the rest of Netflix is also desperately trying to get hold of machines in that region to scale up to meet the demand to actually process movies and the website experience. So we don't want to scale up particularly in then because we're going to be... Um, uh, competing for resources which have better uses at that point. Does that answer your question? Definitely. I guess no more questions. Thank you so much, Jonathan. My pleasure. <laughs> so, uh, Jonathan going to repeat his talk next week at uh, Redwood City. So, someone want to listen twice or? <laughs> or if you, you think you may read difficult questions, you're not have back. <laughs> So uh, on, the, uh, on the coming months, we also have other topics uh, scheduled. If you look at the Meetup website, we have uh, one talk about how to selecting a, a streaming framework. And so the, because we get so many streaming frameworks, and so that's one. And we have an uh, introduction from Databricks by, uh, on Spark R. And uh, also we have another uh, uh, Netflix team talk about their EV cache, how to do their personalization. So they have, they, they're also using Kafka. Uh, and using, I believe, using uh, the <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, they have nine thousand memcached these servers, and so there's a lot of interesting topics that we have scheduled. And uh, you know, on top of the stuff, I haven't really announced yet. So, uh, you know, hopefully, looking forward. See you next time. <laughs>